Hello, I'm Roy Parker. I'm a professor at the University of Arizona and an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Today I'd like to talk to you about the life of eukaryotic mRNA. Eukaryotic mRNAs are produced in the nucleus and then explored to the cytoplasm, where they can be localized to specific regions, translated to produce protein, and ultimately degraded. In my talks today, I'll cover two areas. In the first lecture, I'll talk about the mechanisms and control of localization, translation, and degradation. And then in the second part of my talk, I'll talk about structures in the cells we've been studying referred to as P-bodies and what they tell us about about dynamic transition mRNAs undergo, we refer to as the mRNA cycle. Before beginning my talk about the basic mechanisms of translation, localization, degradation, I want to say a few words about how mRNAs are produced in eukaryotic cells. mRNAs are produced in the nucleus uh, by transcription, followed by RNA processing, which includes splicing and addition of a three prime poly A tail. One of the interesting features about eukaryotic mRNAs is that there can be a wide diversity of events which alter the form of the mRNA. We can have alternative transcription starts, alternative splicing, or alternative polydentylation. And this leads to a wide diversity of transcripts being produced from a single gene, which can influence the nature of the proteins produced, as well as the features of the mRNA, which controls localization, translation, and degradation. During the process of RNA biogenesis in the nucleus, uh, a number of factors begin to associate with the mRNA. These include RNA binding proteins, which just bind to the transcript. But in addition, there are certain complexes which are added during the process of, of RNA processing. For example, the process of splicing, where introns are removed, can deposit a protein of complexes referred to as the exon junction complex at the site where the intron was removed. Many of these factors then travel out to the cytoplasm with the mRNA and can affect its localization, translation, and degradation. And we'll discuss some of these later on in the talk. Now, once in the cytoplasm, mRNAs can be localized to specific regions. For example, this is an image of a crawling fibroblast, and the fibroblast would be crawling towards me across the screen. Within the fibroblast, this red structure is actually the beta-actin mRNA. And you can see it's localized to this leading edge of the fibroblast cell. And that's because actin filaments are assembling at those sites, and so the cell needs newly synthesized actin, preferentially in this region of the cell. So this illustrates one of the reasons that mRNAs are localized in eukaryotic cells, is to allow local production of protein. But there are other examples where we need to localize mRNAs for other reasons. For example, in neurons, the localization of mRNAs to specific synapses affects, allows a rapid and local response to various stimuli. Localizing RNAs can also limit inappropriate interactions and can facilitate the assembly of proteins. For example, by localizing mRNAs to some membrane compartments, mRNAs, proteins can be transported across that membrane during their biogenesis uh, more efficiently. Now, one of the interesting uh, events of the last five years has been that we've learned that many mRNAs are localized in eukaryotic cells. This particular slide illustrates an experiment done in Drosophila embryos where about 3,000 mRNAs were examined for their localization within the embryo. And what you can see here is that there's a large number of diverse patterns, that these mRNAs are not just distributed uniformly across this cell. In fact, of those 3,000 mRNAs, about 71 percent were actually localized, suggesting that the a vast number of mRNAs are actually localized to specific regions. This is true even in very simple cells. For example, if we look at a yeast cell, uh, which is considered a relatively simple eukaryotic cell, we know that about 500 mRNAs are targeted to the surface of the mitochondria. We know about another 700 or so are targeted to the surface of the ER. And we even know that about 20 are targeted to the very tip of the growing cell, uh, the so-called bud tip. And so that even in this organism, Looking at a few compartments, we know of over 1,000 mRNAs which are targeted specific regions. And so the conclusion that we have to draw from this is that there's lots of localization of mRNAs in eukaryotic cells, and that the mechanisms which do that and the specificity are an important part of uh, the control of mRNAs uh, in eukaryotic cells. So an important question then becomes, what's, where is the specificity 
for localization of mRNAs come from. And I want to use the example of yeast ash one mRNA, which is targeted at the bud tip as an example of that. And the basic principle is that the specificity for transporting this RNA out here to the bud tip is found in RNA binding proteins, which bind to the RNA and then uh, attach that to cytoskeletal motors. For example, in this particular RNA, the SHE2 RNA binds to the message and then interacts with a motor complex, which then moves along actin filaments uh, so that it reaches the bud tip. This is a general principle that RNA binding proteins bind to localized RNAs and then target them to specific regions. In many cases, that's by interacting with cytoskeletal motors, but in some cases, it's by interacting with anchors, which are localized to certain parts of the cell to tether the RNA to that vicinity. mRNAs can also be localized by selective degradation of the non-localized pool. So for example, mRNAs can start out distributed throughout the, RNA, the cell, but then RNAs which are not in a specific location can be preferentially degraded. Uh, one example of this is the nanos mRNA, which is localized to the posterior tip of Drosophila embryos. It's distributed throughout the cell, but then degraded in the regions that are not at the posterior pole. Another important general principle of RNA transport is that mRNAs are translationally repressed during the transport process. This is important for two reasons. First, by repressing the mRNA so it's not translated prior to localization, you target the production of the protein to the specific region of the cell where you would like to produce the protein. The second reason is important is that by repressing the translation of the mRNA, you limit the interaction of the ribosome with the mRNA and this decreases the total molecular mass of the complex which needs to be moved through the cell. And this presumably greatly facilitates the transport of mRNAs to distal regions. In the case of the ASH1 mRNA, uh, we can see an example of how this occurs. Two RNA binding proteins, one PUF6 and one KHD1, bind to the RNA and then repress the loading of ribosome subunits. The fact that there are two mechanisms by which translation is repressed illustrates how important it is to keep these localized mRNAs from being translated prematurely before they reach their proper location. Now, if mRNAs are repressed during their transport, an important second principle is that their repression must be relieved once they reach their proper site. And, uh, for example, in the case of the ASH1 mRNA, once the mRNA reaches this bud tip region, there are localized kinases, which are present only in this region of the cell, which phosphorylate these RNA binding proteins. They're released from the mRNA, and the mRNA can then enter translation. So the, the two general principles there to remember are mRNAs are translationally repressed during transport, and that once they reach their specific subcellular location, that repression needs to be relieved, in some cases by uh, previously localized kinases. Now, once an mRNA reaches its proper place, it needs to enter translation. Translation is a complex process, and it has three different phases. Translation initiates with what's called the initiation phase, where ribosomes load on the message, followed by elongation, where the polypeptide chain is produced, where the ribosome moves along the mRNA, translating each of the codons, followed by a termination phase, where the ribosome recognizes the stop codon, releases the newly produced protein, and the ribosome subunits disassemble. Of these three phases, most of the control and regulation of, of translation occurs at the initiation phase over here, where ribosomes load onto the message. So I'll, given that, I'd like to briefly describe how initiation works, and then we'll see how it's regulated in certain cases. So in eukaryotic cell, initiation is a multi-step process, uh, which begins with assembling a cap binding complex. Eukaryotic mRNAs have on their 5' end a specialized cap structure, uh, which then binds to these cap binding proteins, EIF4E and EIF4G. The presence of these proteins being bound, they can also then interact with a protein on the 3' end of the RNA on the poly-A tail, so-called poly-A binding protein. And that, that that complex then is able in a subsequent step to recruit the ribosome, the small ribosomal subunit, to the mRNA. And that small ribosomal subunit is loaded on the mRNA in what's called a 43S complex. And it's called that because it includes other factors 
including initiator tRNA and some translation initiation factors. In a third step, that complex then scans down the mRNA looking for an AUG codon. And typically the first AUG is used in eukaryotic mRNAs. And once that AUG is recognized, there are various rearrangements of that complex, including GTP hydrolysis, which allow for the 60S, the large subunit of the ribosome, to join and then enter into the elongation phase. So I want to emphasize then these two phases. One, assembly of the cap binding complex is an initial stage to build an mRNA protein complex which can receive ribosomes. And then a second step where the ribosome is recruited, recruited typically the small subunit first, and then uh, recognition of the AUG. Now, in some cases, ribosomes can be loaded on messages independent of the cap structure. And this uh, most extreme version of this is what's called an internal ribosome entry site, or an iris, where ribosomes directly interact uh, with the message. Uh, so these are RNA structures, which have been most described in uh, viral RNAs. And they, instead of interacting with, um, in the most extreme version here, they interact directly with the ribosome. This is the, what's called an iris from the cricket paralysis virus. And this has a specific RNA structure, which then binds directly to the small subunit of the ribosome, recruiting it to the message and allowing the initiation of translation. There are a wide variety of these types of irises. For example, in hepatitis uh, C virus, this uh, iris exists, which recruits the ribosome, but does so using one of the initiation factors, which is present in the normal canonical complex. We should expect that many cellular mRNAs include features like internal ribosome entry sites, and one ongoing area of research is describing those uh, in eukaryotic mRNAs. Now, one of the properties of translation is that different mRNAs translate to different rates. And that's due to really two kinds of features. One are intrinsic differences in how the mRNA interacts with the translation machinery. For example, if we look at an mRNA, there are certain differences which can affect its initiation process. For example, some mRNAs can have strong secondary structure in their 5'N, which prevents the ribosome from loading on or scanning to the AUG. So other mRNAs can have what are called upstream ORFs. This would be an AUG and a stop codon before the normal AUG, so that ribosomes which are loading on the message actually start at this AUG, stop, fall off, and therefore limit how many ribosomes can get to the normal AUG. Iris elements can exist in RNAs, which increase their translation. And then the context of the AUG, that is the local sequence context, can affect how well the 40S ribosome can recognize this AUG during the scanning process. And all of these features then can give kind of personalized rates of translation to mRNAs simply by affecting how that mRNA interacts with the translation machinery directly. Layered on top of those intrinsic differences are regulatory components which are targeted to specific mRNAs. So for example, mRNAs can have proteins which bind to their 5'N, which can actually block the scanning of ribosomes and therefore block initiation. Similarly, at the 3 prime end, we can have either RNA binding proteins or microRNAs, which are small RNAs which recognize specific sequences in the RNA and deliver a so-called uh, risk complex for RNA-induced silencing complex to the message, and that these complexes, either protein or microRNA-derived, can inhibit or enhance the function of various translation initiation factors. Finally, some mRNA uh, contain within them binding sites for specific proteins, which when bound, actually lead to modifications of the mRNA. And most notably with regard to translation, are proteins which bind the 3 prime end of mRNAs and then promote the extension of the 3 prime poly A tail. Extending a 3 prime poly A tail can promote translation by a number of mechanisms, but most uh, likely it loads the poly A binding protein which then interacts uh, with the cap complex, uh, providing a better mRNA protein complex for the loading of ribosomes. Translation can be also regulated in a global way by alterations in the functions of specific initiation factors. So for example, uh, when growth is stimulated, 
the TOR pathway is enhanced, and that leads to phosphorylation of a protein that binds the cap binding protein. So when that protein is phosphorylated, it lets go of the cap binding protein. You end up with more cap binding protein, and that promotes uh, the loading of initiation factors on the 5' prime end of mRNAs. So you increase translation generally. Similarly, during a wide variety of stresses, this initiation factor EIF2, which is involved in delivering the tRNA, the initiator tRNA, to the ribosome, gets phosphorylated. And when it's phosphorylated, it gets stuck in a uh, GDP found form with a translation factor called EIF2B, which reduces your ability to form these 43S pre-initiation complexes. So there is global control of translation uh, by the phosphorylation or modification of various key translation factors. Now, one important feature of these global control systems is that they don't necessarily affect every mRNA in the same manner. And I want to illustrate that by using a simple mathematical model for the process of translation initiation. And the larger point I want to make here is that the global control of translation affects mRNAs differently due to their different rate limiting steps in initiation. So let's consider the process of translation in a very simplified view of having three discrete steps. In the first step, we would assemble uh, this cap binding complex on the mRNA. In the second step, the small ribosomal RNA, small ribosomal subunit would scan down the message, find the AUG uh, uh, codon. And in the third step, uh, the large ribosomal subunit would come in and allow for protein production to begin. Now, uh, we can mathematically model this, and in, in doing so, we're going to assume that this third step, the joining of 60S subunit, is relatively fast compared to the other two. And there's evidence in vivo that suggests that's generally true. All right. So what happens if we do that, and then we look at the amount of protein production for how those rates change? And that's illustrated in this slide, where this is basically a graph showing uh, protein production as a function of the rate of assembly of the translation complex and the rate of scanning and AUG recognition. All right, so let's consider two different mRNAs. So if we look down here, this axis here is the rate of assembly. So consider an mRNA whose assembly is slow. Okay, so this would be right here. If we change the rate of scanning and AUG recognition from fast to slow, it doesn't really change the amount of protein production. Right? And that's simply because the rate limiting step is the rate of assembly of the initial translation complex. Conversely, consider an mRNA where the rate of assembly is fast. Okay? So that would be out here. Now, if we change the rate of scanning AUG recognition from fast to slow, we get a significant change in the amount of protein produced. When the rate of, of scanning and AUG recognition is fast, there's a lot of protein. Now, if you decrease it, there's less protein. Whereas for this RNA, there's relatively little change at all, okay? So the important point here is because you have different rate limiting steps, changing a given step may affect an mRNA uh, the same or different from other mRNAs. And I want to emphasize this is a general principle of any pathway which has multiple steps um, or the, where different ones can be rate limiting for different substrates. And this is a reoccurring theme both in translation and also uh, the steps of mRNA degradation, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. Now, some mRNAs are not being translated all the time in eukaryotic cells, and they're actually repressed, perhaps to be translated at a different time or a different place. And that repression of mRNAs commonly inv involves the formation of what I would call a non-functional mRNP, or mRNA protein complex. Interestingly enough, a common theme in those types of complex is that the cap structure is bound by this cap binding protein, EIF4E, we've been discussing. But now, instead of being partnered with EIF4G, it's partnered with other proteins. Here's an example, CUP in Drosophila, or Maskin in uh, Xenopus. And that those then uh, are bound to other RNA sequence specific binding proteins to create a complex which keeps the cap bound by this cap binding protein, but is now uh, unable to go on by binding to other translation factors and enter translation. One of the reasons this is probably such a prevalent type of complex for repression is that by binding the cap here with a cap binding protein, we're actually going to block the major pathway of mRNA degradation. So this not only represses the mRNA for translation, 
but keeps it available by preventing its degradation. And I'll discuss that in a few minutes here when we talk about degradation. Now these repressed mRNAs often end up in large RNA protein granules in the cytoplasm. So for example, uh, repressed RNAs often end up in structures in somatic cells, be they yeast, humans, plants, C. elegans, every eukaryote I've looked at so far, which are called P bodies. And similarly, mRNAs that are repressed in uh, germ cells, where maternal mRNAs are made by the mother, deposited in, in the uh, oocyte, and used in the embryo in certain places and certain times uh, to direct development, are stored in what are called germinal granules. As I'll talk about in my second lecture, these different types of RNA granules are all related to each other and use a common set of RNA binding proteins to regulate the translation and even degradation of many of these mRNAs. And that how these different granules function will be the subject of my second uh, lecture. Now, following translation, every mRNA eventually gets degraded. And uh, I'd like to emphasize three reasons why RNA turnover is actually an interesting area to look at. First, this controls the levels of mRNAs is in a common site of regulation. Obviously, if you uh, make RNAs at different rates, you'll have different concentrations, but the rate at which they are degraded has a tremendous influence on the steady state pool. Second, RNA turnover plays a significant role in uh, defining the transcriptome by degrading many mRNAs which are aberrant. So for example, uh, mRNAs which contain nonsense codons, shown here as red, uh, so that you don't translate the entire open reading frame, are recognized and rapidly degraded in eukaryotic cells. This is a process called nonsense mediated decay. And there are other of these types of quality control pathways which recognize and degrade uh, aberrant or non-functional mRNAs. And this probably is important in both preventing the formation of truncated proteins from this type of RNA, but in also keeping uh, the pool of mRNA in the cytoplasm uh, restricted to those which are functional and which the cell wants to uh, use to produce proteins. Finally, RNA turnover also plays roles in contributing to defense against virus and parasitic elements, such as retrotransposons. Uh, these include things like uh, antiviral microRNAs or RNAs L, and even just competition between the general decay pathway and uh, viral function in many cases. Now, work over the last uh, 20 years really has defined the ways by which RNAs are degraded in eukaryotic cells. Uh, eukaryotic RNAs, when they're born, have this three prime poly A tail as well as the cap structure on their five prime end. In the first step of degradation, this three prime poly A tail is shortened by a variety of nucleases. And the two most uh, important nucleases that I'll be mentioning are a complex called the CCR4 knot complex, which is shown as the blue here, and a second complex referred to as PAN2 and PAN3, which seems to play a more minor role. Following deadenylation, mRNAs can be degraded from the three prime end by a complex called the exosome, which takes advantage of various cofactors to degrade mRNAs, or you know, what's a more common uh, degradation pathway, mRNAs are then decapped, uh, where the cap structure is removed by a decapping enzyme, followed by 5 prime to 3 prime degradation of the RNA. Now, one of the unresolved issues is the uh, distribution of mRNAs between these two general RNA decay pathways. In yeast cells, where more of these experiments have been done, it's clear that this decapping uh, in 5 prime to 3 prime decay pathway is the prevalent pathway by which RNAs are degraded. But we really don't understand in more complex eukaryotic cells, particularly like mammals, uh, which of these decay pathways predominates and whether that's influenced by different cell types or different signaling pathways or even the diversity of different mRNAs. And this is an area of ongoing research uh, currently. So there are two general pathways of RNA degradation, deadenylation leading to 3' prime decay or decapping and 5' prime decay. There are also specialized pathways by which mRNAs are degraded. Uh, so again, another example of quality control, if mRNAs don't have a stop codon, they're recognized and degraded extremely rapidly from the 3' prime end without any deadenylation. Okay? This is a process called uh, non-stop decay. Similarly, RNAs which are recognized as having nonsense codons, at least in uh, simple eukaryotic cells, are subject to very rapid decapping, so bypassing this normal step of uh, deadenylation. 
And a third and growing class of RNA uh, degradation events, which are specialized, are endonuclease cleavage events, which tend to be targeted to specific subclasses of mRNAs that have specific sequences or elements which are recognized and then trigger endonuclease cleavage. Two examples of this I want to highlight. One is uh, cases where microRNAs can trigger cleavage of mRNAs. Okay, and this has been described now in a variety of different uh, eukaryotic cells, most prevalently in plants, but also observed in uh, mammalian cells as well. Another class of endonuclease cleavage is yet another of these so-called quality control systems, where when ribosomes are translating down a message, if they get stuck for any reason, so they're stuck in elongation, that triggers cleavage of the mRNA to rescue that dead end complex uh, and degradation of the um, two pieces. So an unresolved area here is, you know, how diverse are these types of endonuclease cleavages in eukaryotic cells, and uh, how common are these uh, distinct uh, different classes? Now, of course, mRNA rates can vary substantially between individual mRNAs, and this is just an example of this looking at three different uh, yeast mRNAs. Here at the uh, zero time, we block transcription of these mRNAs, and you can see that some, like the PGK message, lasts a long time. Others, like the MFA2 message, are extremely unstable and degrade quickly. In mammalian cells, the average rate of decay uh, of mRNAs is about eight hours, but again, those can vary tremendously. For example, the CFOS mRNA has a half-life of about 15 minutes and degrades very quickly, whereas the beta globin mRNA, which lasts for about 17 hours of a half-life. So there's tremendous differences in these decay rates between individual messages. One feature of mRNAs that controls their decay rates are what people have referred to as so-called stability elements. These are short sequence elements within mRNAs that control the rates of RNA turnover. So for example, within the CFOS mRNA, there's an AU-rich element, or so-called ARE, which uh, can be transferred to the globin mRNA and then cause a rapid deadenylation and rapid uh, decay after deadenylation. And this contrast to the globin message is normally uh, slow for those two steps. So these so-called stability elements then are part of the features of mRNAs which dictate their different rates of RNA turnover. Many of these stability elements serve as binding sites for proteins or microRNAs that then control RNA degradation. In this example I'll use here today, the PUF3 protein is a uh, protein which binds to a short sequence element in the three prime ends of yeast mRNAs, and when it does so, it recruits the CCR4 uh, deadenylase complex, and subsequently can also increase the rate of decapping of that message. And that's a general principle that we see for many of these instability elements, is that they recruit uh, these transacting factors that then uh, directly or indirectly promote the uh, degradation of the message. Now, one of the striking features of RNA decay and translation is kind of how they're intertwined with each other. And I want to highlight this by pointing out the distinct roles of the caps in both uh, translation and RNA degradation. In translation, the cap and the poly A tail serve as binding sites for RNA binding proteins, which then assemble a complex which promotes ribosome loading. Conversely, during degradation, these are the two structures the main nucleases in the cell target. The poly A tail is removed by the CCR4 or PAN2 complex, ultimately leading to decapping of the message by the decapping enzyme. And once the message is decapped, as far as we know, the 5' and 3' prime exonuclease degrades the message extremely rapidly. So in general then, because of these two roles, translation and mRNA decapping are inversely related. So during translation, you have a complex which promotes ribosome loading. During degradation, you lose that complex and you promote degradation. And consistent with that, Various observations support this kind of inverse relationship. If you alter the rate of translation initiation by mutations or alterations to the RNA, you increase the rate of decapping. Similarly, many sequence elements which people identified as either regulating translation or regulating decay do both. For example, the AREs I've talked about, which promote mRNA degradation, often under uh, slightly different conditions, will also repress translation. The way we've interpreted this uh, in general is that there are really two different types of RNA protein complexes existing in the cell, and what I'll call the translation mRNP and the decapping mRNP 
really are distinct. And um, for example, here would be the one type of the translation RNP, and that it would have to then disassemble this translation initiation complex to form an alternative complex, in this case with the decapping complex, in order to be degraded. And the kind of evidence that supports this model comes from uh, either co-immunoprecipitation experiments where RNAs that are bound by translation factors are not bound by decapping factors and vice versa, and also uh, cell biological experiments which indicate that the MR and decapping factors are not associated with polysomes. Polysomes are the ribosome mRNA complexes where proteins are being produced, but instead accumulate in these discrete cytoplasmic foci referred to as P-bodies. And these P-bodies, as I mentioned earlier, are found throughout eukaryotic cells. This is just an example in mammalian cells. And they tend to contain a core set of proteins, including the decapping enzyme, various proteins involved in uh, degradation of those, uh, and activation of decapping, as well as the exonuclease, which degrades following uh, uh, decapping XRN1. In metazoans, these P-bodies can also interact with components of the microRNA silencing pathway, such as argonauts and GW182. And I'll discuss a little bit uh, in my second talk the relationship between these microRNA silencing complexes and these kind of core uh, decapping complexes uh, seen in P-bodies uh, normally. That inverse relationship between translation degradation has suggested a competition between translation factors and translation repression factors, or P-body mRNPs. And that the function of the mRNA in the cell really then reflects how the mRNA is partitioned between translation and repression, okay? And I want to emphasize this because in the past, we've tended to think about whether an RNA can translate or not really as a function of how well it interacted with initiation factors. But what we've learned now is that, in fact, there's so a competing so-called repression complex which then uh, can also drive the RNA into a repressed state, which then can assemble into these larger aggregates that we can even see uh, in the microscope. And that the function of an mRNA then is really, in some sense, perhaps dictated by its distribution between these two different competing uh, assembly pathways. So a key point that led to this kind of model is, has come from an examination of these, the proteins that are involved in triggering mRNA decapping and P-body formation uh, as studied in yeast. And what we know about those proteins is their orthologs in other cells are required for the translation repression of specific mRNAs. So for example, a protein called DHH1, which is involved in promoting decapping in yeast, we know that in uh, many maternal mRNAs is required for the storage of those mRNAs, their translation repression and storage. And we also know that in neurons where many mRNAs are stored, some of those mRNAs, their uh, storage and their uh, preventing them from entering translation requires this ME, the DHH1 protein ortholog. So that, um, so this repression decay complex is not just for driving RNAs into decapping, it's also for maintaining some mRNAs in a translation in the repressed state. And consistent with that, we know that some of these activators can actually be purified now and be shown to directly repress translation uh, in cell-free extracts uh, all by themselves and can in some cases even bind to and inhibit directly the action of some of these uh, translation initiation factors. So the bigger point then is, of course, that these translation repression complexes play a role in translation repression of RNAs as well as targeting them for degradation. Now, I've already told you that localization of mRNAs requires them to be translationally repressed. So now we've described a complex which is involved generally in translation repression might it also have a role in RNA localization? And in general, we don't really know the answer to that question, but there are hints that it will. And I want to highlight that by showing this uh, experiment done in Drosophila embryos, where DCP1, which is a subunit of the decapping enzyme, is actually required for the Oscar mRNA to be localized to the posterior pole of Drosophila embryos. So this is Drosophila embryo here uh, growing, and you can see this green here is the Oscar mRNA that's localized to this region of the cell. Now if we mutate the component of this decapping enzyme, you can see the RNA no longer localizes to the proper region. So this suggests that these components of this translation repression complex not only can affect decapping as well as translational control, but at least in some cases they might even be involved in 
repressing the translation of mRNA so they can be properly localized. So to step back so far, what I've told you about really are three key areas of cytoplasmic mRNA function. Localization of the mRNA, translation, and degradation. And these three processes are coupled with the general rules that you don't translate until you're localized, and you stop translation before you degrade. They may be coupled even more mechanistically because a similar group of proteins, which is involved in translation repression and decapping, is involved in coupling these processes of translation and degradation. So then, an important question then is to try to understand how the fates of different mRNAs uh, are controlled uh, to give different types of localization, different types of translation, and different rates of degradation. And at the simplest level, we can think about this as really how the mRNA interacts with these different machines in the cell. That is, the localization is going to be dictated by how the mRNA and the proteins associated with, with it interact with motors and anchors in the cell. How well it tr the mRNA translates is going to be influenced by how well it interacts with translation factors, either directly or indirectly. And how well it degrades uh, is going to be influenced by its interaction with the degradation machinery. So an important principle to understand then is how do mRNAs interact with these different machines and how is that different between different messages? First, to highlight something we've already talked about, there are intrinsic differences between different mRNAs. Uh, so we've already talked about how with translation, uh, some mRNAs can have irises, which allows them to interact directly with the translation machinery, bypassing the need for certain translation initiation factors. Similarly, there are examples where RNAs interact directly with the RNA decay machinery and therefore influence their fate. For example, in mammalian cells, the RRP41 mRNA has a high affinity binding site for the DCP2 protein. This is the decapping enzyme. And so the presence of that sequence leads to this mRNA being rapidly degraded. So these are intrinsic differences with how they interact with the cytoplasmic machinery. Then we also have layered on top of that again sequence-specific RNA binding proteins and how they interact with these machineries as well. So I just want to give two examples of this. So in mammalian cells, there's a protein called uh, HUD. It's an RNA binding protein that binds to these ARE elements again. And once it does, it also has a region which can bind to the, uh, uh, one of the initiation factors uh, in the cap binding complex and therefore promote uh, faster rates of translation initiation. Okay. So an RNA specific, specific binding protein binding to the message recruiting the translation machinery. We see the exact same process with RNA degradation. Here's an RNA binding protein, uh, MBT5, which binds to certain mRNAs in yeast cells and then has direct interactions with components of this CCR4 uh, deadenylase complex. So the presence of this protein recruits the nuclease to the message and leads to much faster rates of deadenylation. So direct interactions between RNA binding proteins and either translation machinery or uh, mRNA degradation machinery. And we might ask, how much of this kinds of uh, regulation should we expect? And we should expect a lot of it. If we look in the, yeast, in the genomes of organisms, there's a tremendous number of RNA binding proteins. The initial drafts of the human genome predicted greater than 1,000 RNA binding proteins. And this is probably an underestimate because we know that many proteins bind RNA which don't have sequence motifs which allow them to be identified as RNA binding proteins. Similarly, the yeast genome, uh, has greater than 600 RNA binding proteins. In general, these RNA binding proteins are probably going to bind mostly to the 3' UTR, the 3' untranslated region. And that's uh, simply for, for two reasons. Uh, one is that if you think about the 5' end of the message um, or the open reading frame, these are constrained evolutionarily by their function in translation. The ORF has to maintain the proper coding region for the protein. And uh, in both cases, the ribosome has to be able to pass through these regions, okay? And that, therefore, any regulatory proteins which bind will be dislodged by the passage of ribosomes. Um, and so this puts constraints on the ability of these regions to function as regulatory sites for RNA binding factors. In contrast, the 3 mutr really is free to evolve new structures, new binding sites, and factors that bind here are not going to be displaced by uh, transversing ribosomes and can maintain their association with the message and therefore regulate its function in a more efficient manner.
So how many factors should we expect to bind in? And we don't really know the answer to this question. Uh, um, the average, uh, using humans as an example, the average 3' UTR is about 740 nucleotides, although it can vary tremendously from 60 to 4,000. Okay. So, but how many factors might you expect to bind here? Well, a, a low estimate might be one factor per every 100 bases. Uh, but we know that in general, uh, proteins bind to sequence elements of around uh, 10, and microRNAs bind to around 20 nucleotides. So maybe a high estimate would be one factor binding per every 20 bases, which would lead to 37 factors bound. Now this is probably unrealistic, uh, but, um, uh, but even at the low estimate of seven proteins or factors being bound to the 3 UTR, you can see that the average message will have multiple regulatory factors bound to its 3 prime end, and therefore its control of localization, translation, and degradation will probably be a summation of the impacts of all these different factors and not just the impact of a single sole protein. Now, a few other principles of these RNA binding proteins which are important to consider. First, they can affect more than one process. I want to go back to the PUF3 protein in yeast that we use as an example of a factor that binds and promotes RNA degradation. Uh, but we also know that this protein also binds and targets a subset of RNAs to localize to the surface of mitochondria. So this single protein, then, can both promote degradation and target RNAs for proper subcellular localization. And there are many examples of this, where RNA binding proteins uh, affect more than one process in the cytoplasm. Okay. Proteins associated with RNAs range from uh, very general to, very, to highly specific. This is a diagram of the number of mRNAs associated with about 40 different uh, RNA binding proteins. Uh, based on co-immune precipitation from yeast cells. And what you can see is that some uh, proteins, for example out here, the poly A binding protein, which we think of as relatively uh, general, binds to approximately 1,000 mRNAs. And down here at the other extreme, uh, some proteins which we think would bind to uh, RNAs only bind to, uh, you know, a few, less than five, okay? So, RNA binding proteins can be either highly general, binding to many, many factors in the cell, or highly specific. And one thing we don't understand well at all is really what are the diversity of different RNP types and how does that affect uh, the function of mRNAs in cells. But one thing we do know is that in many cases, RNA binding proteins then co-regulate mRNAs which have related function. So for example, this, using the PUF3 protein as an example again, the PUF3 protein binds to about 200 mRNAs in yeast cells, and essentially all 200 of those proteins encode proteins involved in mitochondrial function. Okay, and so it would make sense that they would actually, A, be coordinately controlled uh, for their degradation, and for their targeting to a specific subcellular location. And consistent with that, PUF3 targets these mRNAs to the mitochondrial surface, and promotes their degradation under conditions where mitochondrial are not uh, as important in the physiology of cells of these cells. All right. So in the last few minutes, what I want to do is talk about mRNP assembly uh, in the different stages and, and how dynamic it is. And this is important because I think that what I've tried to convince you of in the last few minutes is that the proteins associated with mRNAs are really important in dictating how well it's translated, degraded, and where it's localized within the cell. And so we need to think then about uh, what is the process by which these proteins are assembled on mRNAs, and, and how does it change? And there are a few uh, general principles I want to uh, highlight here. First is that mRNP assembly begins in the nucleus. So I began the talk by mentioning this fact, but that many RNA binding proteins are imported into the nucleus, assemble with the nascent transcript, and then are exported with the RNA out into the cytoplasm. And in fact, as we study more and more proteins that bind to mRNA. This is becoming uh, uh, more of a common theme where many, many factors are loading on the message in the nucleus, uh, probably as the, uh, as the RNA is being produced co-transcriptionally. Once the mRNA is exported to the cytoplasm, simply being in a different subcellular compartment can promote some transitions in the RNA uh, protein complexes. For example, in the nucleus, when uh, there's a certain complex that binds to the 5'N called the nuclear cap binding complex. And 
once the mRNA reaches the cytoplasm, the presence of RAN GDP, which is a, a protein GDP complex, which is at high levels in the cytoplasm, whereas in the nucleus you tend to have a related RAN GTP complex, the presence of that RAN GDP causes loss of that nuclear cap binding complex and loading this cytoplasmic cap binding complex we talked about, the EIF4E and 4G, which promotes translation onto the messages. And that simply occurs because the mRNA is now in a compartment with a different concentration of RAN GDP. Similarly, localization to specific subcellular regions can affect the exchange of proteins. For example, uh, the beta, mRNA, beta actin mRNA I mentioned in the beginning, which is targeted to the uh, uh, leading edge of a crawling fibroblast, when it, when it reaches out there, a protein which targets it there, called the zip code binding protein, uh, is phosphorylated by the SARC kinase, which is localized to that part of the cell, and is caused to be released from the mRNA. So simply being, because different compartments in the cell have different biochemical properties, that can change the proteins which are associated with the message at different places within the cell. Another way that proteins are exchanged is through the process of translation. When the message comes out of the nucleus, uh, presumably there are many proteins which are bound to the coding region, and one example of that would be this exon junction complex, which is deposited at splice junctions, which are predominantly found within the coding region. When ribosomes reach an uh, exon junction complex, they dissociate it through direct uh, interactions, and they cause that to be bumped off the message. And so the, the entry of mRNAs in translation and the movement of ribosomes down the message cause the loss of essentially the proteins which are bound to the coding region um, uh, from the mRNA complex. Whereas mRNAs which are bound to the 3' UTR, uh, we anticipate remain bound relatively stably, although there's no direct measurements for what the dynamics of those proteins are uh, within cells. Finally, mRNAs can be dynamic in ways uh, that we really uh, don't understand yet, but involve large-scale rearrangements in the set of proteins associated with this. One thing I'll talk about in my second lecture is that during times of stress, mRNAs can exit translation and assemble a different complex of proteins involving the translation repression complex and decapping factors we've talked about. Okay? And when they do that, they actually lose all these translation factors which are currently on the message. These mRNAs that are repressed can then re-enter translation at later times, uh, then losing all these factors and reassembling a new translation complex. So there can be large-scale rearrangements of the mRNAs associated with proteins. The mechanisms by which these occur and their frequency uh, really are not well understood at all yet, but we know that, that they can occur. Finally, the proteins associated with mRNAs are dynamic in that they're modulated by, their, by modifications. For example, in this one I want to give here, uh, a protein called BRF1, which binds the 3' end of mammalian messages and promotes their degradation uh, by the deadenylase, uh, can be phosphorylated in response to various uh, signal transduction pathways. And once phosphorylated, that recruits a uh, protein which binds to that phosphoprotein complex, blocking the ability of BRF1 to recruit the deadenylase. Now, so not only are the proteins dynamic then, they can be modulated by modification. And the list of modification of RNA binding proteins has grown extremely long and continues to grow. We now know of many proteins that are methylated, acetylated, ubiquinated, can be uh, O-glicnac modified. They can be ADP ribosylated, sumylated, and the example I already gave you, phosphorylated. So what this means then is that uh, even for mRNA binding proteins which remain stably bound to the message, their function can be modified dramatically in response to various uh, signal transduction pathways or environmental cues simply by changing their modification status. Finally, the mRNA itself is modified. As we talked about during the process of degradation, mRNAs which are born have long polytails and then lose them. This is really a modification of the RNA sequence, but then also affects the RNP composition because it removes binding sites for the poly-A binding protein. Other modifications can happen to this RNA. Poly-A tails can be added back, which provides new binding sites for poly-A binding protein, and therefore can nucleate the assembly of new translation complexes. In the last few years, we've also learned that mRNAs can undergo a process called uridenylation, where poly-U tails are added to the 3' end of the message. And this can recruit 
uh, at least some components of the RNA degradation pathway. But what the, because this is a relatively new discovery, what the roles of polyuridinylation are and the diversity of factors that bind to those really remain to be discovered. Finally, we have to anticipate there are other modifications to RNAs, uh, perhaps methylation of nucleotides uh, that uh, just have yet to be discovered. But by changing the covalent structure of the RNA itself, that can also influence the proteins that are bound and its interaction with these various machines regulating translation, degradation, and localization. Okay. So I've tried to give you a big picture then today of the three important processes in the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells, mRNA localization, translation, and degradation. And these are really uh, very important for regulating the amount, the duration, and the location of protein production in complex eukaryotic cells. One principle that's emerged from studying these is that they're actually all interconnected with localization, requiring the message to be translationally repressed until it's localized, with translation being related to degradation because you stop translation before you degrade it. And the, the proteins that are involved in regulation of translation uh, can play multiple roles in repressing translation until you're localized, stopping translation for degradation, or repressing translation for, for mRNA storage in cases where mRNA needs to be stored and translated at later times. A third important principle really is that the proteins that are associated with the message as well as the message's interactions with the translation and degradation machinery directly, really are what define the mRNA-specific properties of localization, translation rate, and half-life. And that uh, an important goal would be to understand uh, what these proteins are and how they uh, function. And finally, these RNPs are dynamic and are modulated by many uh, types of transitions, both in uh, composition and modification, as well as modification of the RNA itself. And so that we can't think of the RNA protein complex as a static structure, we have to think of it as one that's constantly under flux uh, at many different uh, levels of control. So uh, this leads to a number of different uh, issues in the future here. You know, one of the things that we don't understand very well, what the diversity and dynamics of mRNP types are and how that relates to RNA function. You know, in many ways, we can think about RNA protein complexes analogous to DNA protein complexes. But the difference is that DNA is relatively homogeneous, whereas RNAs can be extremely heterogeneous. They can fold into much more complex and diverse structures. And so it could be that there's a tremendous diversity of different types of RNP types, uh, and uh, we just don't understand those yet. We don't understand these modifications. Again, analogous to DNA, you know, there's an idea of a histone code where different modifications to chromatin influence whether the RNA, the DNA, is available or inaccessible for transcription. Is there a corresponding code for mRNAs where different types of modifications on these mRNA binding proteins drive RNAs either into repressed states or translation state, and that therefore uh, regulation of those modifications become important control points for regulating either the general level of translation or the translation of specific mRNAs within the cell. And finally, one has to hope that as we continue on in this field, uh, by developing um, an understanding of these principles, we might be able to develop a predictive model of mRNA function based on sequence, which integrates all these different properties and would allow us to be able to predict uh, how, where mRNAs will end up in the cell, how frequently they'll be translated, and for how long they will last uh, on average. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm done. <laughs>